Today we're going to get into my 10 takeaways from Oklahoma's 52 to 27 skull dragging of TCU. And all that's coming up after the bumper. What do you mean oh. you don't subscribe to my son's YouTube channel? Mama, no! Just snap the damn ball, RJ! What's up, kid folk? It's RJ Young. I am not on a step mill. Consider hitting the like and subscribe button because I upload a video every single day. It's all it's OU related, college football related, sports related. We have a good time. And today, we are going to get into my 10 takeaways from Oklahoma's 52 to 27 skull dragging of the TCU Horn Frogs. But first, I got this book coming out. It's called Let It Bang. It's available wherever books are sold. Comes out Tuesday. Throw a party. All right, so my first takeaway from Oklahoma's win is that Kennedy Brooks has an argument to be RB1. 18 carries, 168 yards with a touchdown, particularly in a game where it didn't look like Trey Sermon was doing as much as he probably could do, right? He had 13 carries, 55 yards, and then picked it up and put him down for his last four carries to get him over 100 yards, 17 carries, 110 yards total to go along with two touchdowns. Now, I think this is interesting in a game where Oklahoma was committed to running the football. 47 rush attempts for 323 yards. You're probably not going to throw for 300 yards in a game where you rush for 300, and yet Kyler Murray was still responsible for four touchdowns. He was 19 of 24 for 213 with a QB rating of 208. But the most gaudy statistic when it comes to Kennedy Brooks and the rushing attack was combined. Three rushers, Kyler Murray, Trey Sermon, Kennedy Brooks, were 6.9 yards per carry. And Kennedy Brooks averaged 9.3 yards per carry. What I like about Kennedy Brooks is he's smooth. Where Trey Sermon is a powerful dude who intends to hit the truck stick more often than not, Kennedy Brooks sees a hole and just makes his way through it. He doesn't look especially fast, though he is. He doesn't look especially big, though he is. He just knows how to hit the hole and get it done. He is a walking, talking first down. My next takeaway is defensive related, which is awesome because I'm going to have good things to say about the defense today, which is something that we haven't been able to do in the last couple of months. And they held a backup quarterback to 7 of 17 for 142 yards, 2 TDs, and a pick. This had been some sort of curse that I think was lifted on Oklahoma because in the past, backup quarterbacks kind of carve Oklahoma up. This is going back to last season when Kyle Kemp came in and torched Oklahoma and we can continue to see that trend kind of sort of play out in Big 12 competition. This year, Zeb Nolan at Iowa State, 3 for 360 yards. He's arguably the third best quarterback at Iowa State. And we just haven't fared well when it comes to passing attacks. So it was really cool to see Oklahoma hold a Big 12 offense to under 200 yards passing. And have an opportunity to pick off at least three passes. Had one. But we all know that the one that Boogie dropped should have been a pick six. And Khalil Houghton basically dropped a pop fly. That said, when you hold two different guys to 10 of 25 for 163 yards, two TDs, and an INT, you're doing pretty good. Oklahoma benched the best quarterback prospect TCU has ever signed. That's a win. Another win comes in the form of Oklahoma's offensive line, which benefits from not just consistency, but continuity. I made this point in the live stream chat yesterday. The offensive line is really good at Oklahoma. So good that people still think they can doubt it because they don't necessarily look great every time they go out. But what they do do is put together 100-yard rushers and 300-yard passers. They got a guy who is a favorite to win the Heisman Trophy playing quarterback and still had 200-yard rushers in a game against Gary Patterson's defense. And we all know that Gary Patterson's defense is the gold standard in the Big 12. And not only do you drop 52 on him, you mashed him for 300 yards on the ground. Yes, there were two just stupid penalties that I don't necessarily think are on Creed Humphrey or Cody Ford. The one on Creed Humphrey was him being downfield. He's four yards downfield when the cushion's about three. And the other one was Cody Ford, illegal formation because he was just a head farther off the ball than he should have been. Both of these are ticky-tacky fouls. Both of these are the Zebras inserting themselves in such a way that they were the only things that could slow down Oklahoma's offense. Bill Biedenboe has done wonders with the offensive line since his return, and I expect that position to only get stronger. I mean, he put a unanimous All-American into the NFL last year. My next takeaway is that the defense is improved. Full stop. The defense held TCU to 20 points, three points in the second half of the game, under 300 yards of total offense, under 200 yards passing, 
3.7 yards per rush, 4 of 14 on third down. You're looking for ways to feel like the defense is finding its way. Those statistics will point you in that direction. But if that's not what you're looking for, and you're the kind of person who wants to say secondary still ain't very good, okay, well, look up what they did give up. A couple touchdown passes and five catches for 62 yards to Kevontae Turpin. That's really what they gave up. What they didn't do was convert opportunities for takeaways into takeaways. You had your lone takeaway from Parnell Motley, though, which is in the secondary that everybody wants to bag on. What you saw was a sound defense that was simple so that the players ran fast within themselves and played to their abilities, which is what you have at Oklahoma. You have a bunch of talented kids that you need to just make the game real simple for and let their ability take over. And I think we're going to see the defense continue to get better as Ruffin McNeil basically makes the scheme real simple and say, go do your job. Go do what you know how to do, which is play football. And when you could stop an offense that put up 500 yards of offense against Ohio State and all of the NFL dudes they're going to put into the league, you know you're doing something right. My next takeaway is that Oklahoma got a red zone stop. Hadn't got a red zone stop all season. Everybody that got into the red zone against Oklahoma scored. And yes, that streak has ended. Let's not put too fine a point on it. Ended on the seventh game in the third quarter on a missed field goal. But it did end. But Oklahoma also deserved a red zone stop in this game. The defense was informed, to use my soccer terminology. And for the most part, everybody looked like they knew what they were supposed to do and graded out pretty well on the defensive side of the ball. My next takeaway is if you get the turnover from Khalil Houghton and you turn that into seven, the game is 35 to seven. If you get the pick from Buki and you turn that into seven, the game is 42 to seven. And we're talking about this defense as being a world beater instead of just much improved. That's how big a deal those two passes were. The other three games that TCU has lost, Sean Robinson threw two interceptions in each of those losses. Oklahoma just didn't convert the piss-poor pass into an INT. My next takeaway is that Kyler Murray is still Kyler Murray. I mentioned the stats for the TCU game, but I'm going to put a little bit finer a point on that. He's completing 72% of his passes. He's 115 of 159 this season. With 1,977 total yards passing and 25 passing TDs to go along with 428 yards on the ground on 66 rushes with 5 TDs. The man has 2,400 total yards and 30 TDs. Kyler Murray is a singular figure in college football. He just happens to be playing in the same season as another guy who is a singular figure in college football in Tua Tonga-Valoa. It's a two-horse race for Heisman, and whichever one of those dudes flinches first is going to lose. My next takeaway is that the penalties for Oklahoma were atrocious. One, because, well, getting penalties is bad. Two, because many of the penalties were the referees being nitpicky and mean. Yeah, I said it. They were mean. Look, the kids did a choreographed Dragon Ball Z celebration for their first touchdown at Amon G. Carter Stadium, and the official took offense because it was choreographed. And then you had Parnell Motley get called for making a non-football move that made the wide receiver flinch. And then you had the illegal formation on Cody Ford, and you had the illegal man downfield on Creed Humphrey. What I'm saying is a lot of these penalties were just the referees choosing to tighten up on the playbook. And it's kind of odd that you choose Oklahoma as the team to tighten up on, seeing as Oklahoma is the best team in this conference. It's almost like the Big 12 doesn't want Oklahoma in this conference. And it looks even worse when Kevontae Turpin returns a TD because he doesn't get full credit for that. Because the unsportsmanlike conduct penalty picked up by C.D. Lamb and Marquise Brown didn't allow Austin Cyber to kick the ball out of the end zone, allow Kevontae Turpin to take the ball 99 yards to the house. So that's seven points on the board, courtesy of the referees. Still eight for 60, that's a lot. My next takeaway is that yes, the defense still needs to tackle, but we knew this and I wanted the tackling to get better during the bye week. I wanted everybody to just do Oklahoma drill. Clearly, that's not what they did, but if they're going to play this kind of fundamental sound defense, missed tackles can happen because other guys are around to help out. Then again, I watched Hakeem Butler go through the middle of the defense and break about three tackles. So yes, clean up the missed tackles, but clean them up how? Just have one-on-one -on -one tackling drills instead of game planning for Kansas State, although that might be a good game plan for Kansas State because you're going to get a heavy dose of Alex Barnes. And if you can't tackle Alex Barnes, Kansas State's going to win. So no, we can't let missed tackles slide. We have to continue to harp on it, wrap guys up, put them on the ground, that's playing defense. My next takeaway is that Oklahoma didn't beat itself. That's really big. There were no blown coverages. There was no Mark Jackson fading back in the coverage or matching up on the outside across from a Trey Watson. Everybody knew their job. Everybody was in position to make a play. That's what you want from your defensive coordinator. 
And the last takeaway is that we saw a lot of 4-2-5 and a lot of 3-3-5. And I understand it. You're not going to blow up the defensive scheme totally in the middle of the season, especially when you have an opportunity to make the college football playoff. However, Ruffin McNeil, being a 4-3 guy, I expected to see more of that. And we're just not going to because Ruffin McNeil is putting the kids first. If you put too much on them, instead of simplifying a game that they know how to play, they're not going to play well. And I applaud him for that, for making himself uncomfortable but also coaching to his personnel, which is the job of any coach. Make yourself uncomfortable, coach to your personnel, let your kids go win football games. Players win, coaches lose. Oklahoma can still make the college football playoff. Oklahoma has to win out to have a chance to do that, though. All right, that's it for me. Deuces. <laughs> <laughs>